Hello, my name is Jim Lesko. I'm the Executive Director at Amherst Community Television and welcome to Amherst Talk after the Amherst Walk. Today we're, we're very excited to have our first artist, Richard Sklove, who's joining us tonight um, to be a part of the Art Walk of Amherst. And this has been going on for about six, seven years and it's a pleasure to be a part of that finally. So welcome Richard and thank you for putting your photography up on our walls. Thank you, Jim. And I just uh, want to go formally here for a moment and just let people know who you are. I know you're very well known in the Amherst area, but this show actually gets bigger play now with the web. Um, Dick, you're, you're the founding, Dick Sklove, or Richard Sklove as he's known in India, is founder and fellow of the Loco, Loco Institute in Amherst, Massachusetts, and author of many articles as well as well-regarded book, Democracy and Technology, which was published in 1995. You're, um, he's also the founder of FastNet, the Federation of Activists on Science and Technology Network. He also holds a bachelor's degree in environmental studies from Hampshire College, as well as an MS in nuclear engineering and PhD in political science, both from MIT. He did a postdoctoral fellowship in economics at the University of California at Berkeley, and has held visiting professorships at Clark University and Rensselaer Polytechnic Institute. So that's quite an impressive background, Richard. And, uh, now you're here with your photography, so I guess there's a something changed, something happened. And what I'd like to start with is, what is an influence? Uh, most of us at some point look back and say, well, why did I start uh, doing art? Why did I start painting? Or who was it that influenced me? Or whose work? Do you remember at what point photography became a really important part of your life? It uh, there have been two epis, two phases. It started uh, being a, a, a geeky. Uh, junior high school sciencey kind of guy, where I think photography became an, a creative outlet as some alternative co or complement to the sort of science geekiness. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. And as I was going through finishing high school and going on to college, I was sort of contemplating: was like my career going to be sort of science oriented, or was I going to try and be an arts photographer? And I had it apprenticed in New York City with uh, with arts photographers while I was going to high school, uh -huh. and. Uh, and then I kind of hit a, a juncture <laughs> when I was 19 where um, I kind of f doing, I was moving away from being a pure scientist into sort of save the world related scientific activities and uh, related in those days to politics of nuclear power and the environment. And it was kind of, and it was very, to do it well, that was very time consuming. To do arts photography well was incredibly time consuming and I kind of ha faced a juncture point where I had to decide which one to do. And, um, it just seemed to me at the time that the world needed a lot of saving. It was <laughs> around 1973, so at that point I basically put the photography away mm. and, uh, and only came back to it about five years ago. Was there any photographers that influenced you at an early age that you were really drawn to or was...? Um, yeah, I liked uh, the photography that, well, I think different kinds. I liked photography that was a bit on the surreal side. Jerry Yulesman, uh, Dwayne Michaels influenced me in high school. And at the same time, I was drawn towards kind of uh, beautiful nature photography and s more heart-based social work. Um, I'm thinking of Eugene Smith, W. Eugene Smith's uh, black and white photography. Um, those were, those were uh, and along with Ansel Adams, those were photographers yeah. who influenced yeah. me in my, in my teenage years. Well, I think all of us were influenced at an early age by National Geographic and just the beauty of that and, and other photographers that were taking for me, it was photojournalism and, and that whole life and, and look magazines just abounded. You know, it wasn't so age. much that documentary style no. for me. Um, I was almost more drawn also to minor white. I mean, even then, I was beginning to have a, some spiritual interest mm -hmm. when I was sort of 18, 19, and sort of photographers who had a sort of a spiritual sensibility in what they were doing probably had more draw for me than the photojournalism. If I can, the story I saw, which I think you started to talk about when you were 19 you had a, a very specific uh, job that you were asked to do for a professional photographer that included that moment where you said I think I want to go in a different direction could you just tell a little bit more about what that was yeah I was um, when I was I started at Middlebury College and I dropped out after a year and a half because I was confused and didn't know what I wanted to do 
and I ended up apprenticing with a photographer in New York City who was just opening his own studio. And one of the early jobs he got was working for a new, an, an electric power utility who wanted us to put together a, a, sl a fancy slideshow with music, uh, selling the, touting the benefits of nuclear power. This was around 1973. And we put together an initial show and the utility, which was based in uh, the Washington, D.C. area, said the kids, the, the kids and people in the show are too white looking. We need more ethnicity and more people of color. So we went out to Brooklyn and shot, did a, sh a shoot with uh, these school kids of, you know, mu very mul multicultural, multicolored uh, little school kids, eight and nine years old. And I was just feeling really ambivalent about that. I, I knew from my science side and my you know, interest in environmentalism, I had ambivalent feelings about nuclear power. There were doubts being expressed about its safety. And I also felt like this was being pretty exploitative of these little kids. For the, you know, it wasn't for their benefit that we were shooting them. We were shooting them to help an electric utility company you know, market nuclear power. And I just sort of felt like if this is photography, it was kind of at a juncture point for me between my environmental and political side and the photography thing. And it felt like, well, if, if the way to make a, a living as a photographer is exploiting people to sell something I'm not sure is good for the planet, I'm not sure this is the direction I should be going right now. And it sort of is part of what led me to put the camera aside at that point and move into sort of environmental and science politics. So in that case, it was one incident that's just huge change in your direction in your life. So I understand that I'm going to jump ahead now in that what, what I read is that you picked up the camera again 32 years later at, in your early 50s and, and went back to your alma mater, Hampshire College, and what, you audited a class at that point? Yeah, because I was an alum of Hampshire, they allowed me kindly to audit it. Uh, I had shot, you know, of course, film when I was a teenager and I had gotten intrigued. One reason I went back to photography, I was, I was taking a, life a midlife sabbatical from my professional work. And uh, I had, as a kid, loved doing darkroom work, but also felt a little isolated, uh, spending hours and hours in a darkroom cut off from the world and people. And I kind of realized that with digital and with Photoshop, everything I used to be able to do in a darkroom and a lot more uh, well, you still have to be in front of a computer screen, but at least you didn't have to be alone in the dark. <laughs> and that got me intrigued about, uh, about learning digital photography. And, and at the same time, I was taking a sabbatical from a, a professional kind of science activism career and uh, kind of re putting time into rediscovering my spiritual life. And for, for, for me, photography had always been a, a creative outlet with a spiritual dimension to it. Well, I must admit, the, on your Flickr account, which we'll make sure is up at the end of this for people to see your work, um, I, it was very intriguing that the photo you used, which went back to that when you were a 19-year-old, from the shot that changed your life direction to a current shot. And it's just amazing. I, I think you really capture that transition, both from the past and the present transitions. And it's a beautiful piece of work, and, and I really enjoyed it. But saying that, uh, you were also involved with a spiritual community based in Sonoma, uh, California, yeah. the ashram at Sonoma, and there's a relationship uh, in India in that you've just come back recent, fairly recently with your, your wife, Marcy, and your daughter, Lena, and you were there for almost a year? Yeah, it was a couple of years ago, but we live, we, we, uh, 2006 07, we, we lived for the academic year in a small <coughs> ashram with a spiritual community that also had an orphanage for boys in uh, the northern India city of Benares. Now, can you just explain now, the, the, most of the photos that are up at the show today were taken during that period, if I'm correct. Yeah. And, and could you explain a little bit about the, the situation of that city that you were in, Benares? What is it, the past, what is its condition? Yeah, it, uh, Benares is uh, a very intense, contrad full of contradictions, incredibly alive place. It's, it's uh, a contender for being the oldest continuously inhabited city on the planet. It might or might not be, but it's up there. It's, it's very ancient. Uh, the Buddha gave, the historical Buddha gave his first sermon on the outskirts of Benares. And because, and that presumably that, the reason for that was that if you wanted to establish yourself as a spiritual teacher in his day, 2,500 years ago, Benares was already the hot, the hot, the hot place where you had to pr prove your stuff as a spiritual teacher. So he went there to establish his cred. Uh, 2,500 years ago, it was already going strong in an established spiritual center 
Um, and it continues to this day in, in the Hindu imagination. It's, uh, it's often seen as the most sacred city on the planet. And I also, there's a project that you're involved with there, um, not only for the street children, education of street children, but uh, reclamation of forestry in, or a private... Well, yeah, there, uh, one of the many contradictory paradoxes of Benares is on the spiritual level, it's seen as the, uh, the urban home of Lord Shiva, one of the great mm -hmm. you know, gods of the, of the Hindu pantheon, and, and a city in the spiritual imagination, it's a city uh, paved in gold where all sins and all impurities are purified. That's at the spiritual level. On the material and historical dimension, it's one of the most intensely polluted places <laughs> I've ever seen. And so uh, the spiritual teacher who established the ashram where we lived in Benares is oriented towards doing uh, social service projects. And one of the new projects he's got going in Benares is to, uh, is to build an educational environmental demonstration center where school children and farmers and, and people in the city can learn about sustainable practices be, uh, because right now basically it's, it's a city where a substantial amount of raw sewage flows straight into the sacred Ganges River. So as we were talking before the show you said that, that the pollution there is not uh, what we think of here in this country as pollution being created by industry in its immediate locale but it's on the river that uh, upstream is a lot of pollution coming down. Is that the there, there are multiple sources of pollution. There's, there's, uh, it's not a heavily industrialized city, but uh, you know, a hundred, a hundred and more miles upstream, there is heavy industry that's polluting the river all the way along. There's raw sewage flowing in, and in, di in addition, uh, Benares is seen as uh, the most favorable place to die if you're a Hindu, and people come there for. Uh, cremation, because it's believed that at the moment of cremation, if you die and are cremated in this particular city, uh, Lord Shiva whispers a, a mantra of, uh, of liberation into your ear, and you don't have to be reborn into a life of further suffering. Um, but one result of that is that there's cremation going on there, and residues of cremation in human bodies are going into the river as well <laughs> all the time. Yet the vibrancy of that city is just, as you were saying, is, and your photography captures, is just overwhelming in, in, a, in a positive way. Yeah, it's, um, there, there, my family and I tell a, a kind of a story about Benares. It has multiple names, the city. The, the normal uh, Hindi name is Benares the, the, uh, or Varanasi. Um, and, uh, but it's got a couple of spiritual names, one of which is Kashi, which is uh, the city of Lord Shiva. Mm -hmm. And uh, on the material level, Benares is this highly polluted, you know, modern, urbanized, quasi-urbanized place without, with poor ur uh, infrastructure, heavy pollution, overcrowded, really noisy, really stinky, um, dysfunctional in many ways. On the spiritual level, there's this mythology that you know Kashi, the, the home of Lord Shiva, is this you know incredibly pure place, pulsing with spiritual energies, where the streets are and this and the buildings are all paved with gold. Um, the thing is, people have I'd say one of two reactions to this city. The first, if a visitor there from the west, the first time you go there, if you land in Benares, this overcrowded, polluted place, you probably are going to say, get me out of here as fast as I can. This is overwhelming. It smells. I can't stand people coming at me begging for money. I'm dismayed about everything here. Please get me to somewhere better. That's if you land in Benares. On the other hand, it's a city where for thousands of years, literally millions of people have been doing really intense spiritual practices. And there appears to be a cumulative energy of that that some people have the right tuning fork in their head where they feel it. And if you can feel those pulsing spiritual energies, in a sense, you are not in Benares, you're in Kashi. And if you're in touch with that Kashi energy, you know, the, all the crazy, overcrowded, congestion, pollution thing, you see it, but it just doesn't affect you at the, at the same way because you're also in touch with something, you know, deeply meaningful yeah. and powerful. I've heard that often from people that have gone and been very moved in India and in different locations mm -hmm. in India that they, there's really no word, it's something you have to experience. You can try to explain it, and you did a very good job of explaining it, but that you really do need to, and I think a lot of people feel a draw and sometimes they don't even know why initially to India for that reason. And, and as a photographer, let me ask you, um, 
and as a scientist and, and, and as a social conscious, very involved individual, what kind of shift occurred in you when you did go there? Was there did you find yourself in that creative process come back after so long? Or is it always there, but you're able to manifest it? And it um, well, out? I mean, the going to, you know, I was taking a, you know, kind of a midlife sabbatical and were interested in, in doing spiritual practice. So <laughs> that motivated me to go to India. And then India didn't disappoint in nourishing that wish. Um, at the same time, I mean, sometimes the photography, I don't know why I initially picked up the camera there, partly just to tell people at home what we're experiencing and emailing home photographs. But the, the other thing about India is that um, it's really hard to take a great photograph there or anywhere. But on the other hand, to take a good photograph, I tell people in India, you can put the camera on timed release, close your eyes, spin around 180 degrees, toss it up in the air, and it'll go <laughs> off. And that won't be a great photograph, but it'll be a, an interesting, good photograph. I mean, it's just not, <laughs> it's so rich that, that, you know, taking interesting, good photographs, not hard to do. And then there was also for me, though I wasn't, didn't think of it at the time, but I'd say over time it was, I found myself trying to see, is there a way with this physical apparatus, this technical physical apparatus, to convey some of the spiritual sensibility that I feel here? And, and that's this thing where, which part of the appeal of, of photography to me is that it does integrate left and right brain stuff. On the one hand, you do have to know a fair amount of technical stuff, but on the other hand, when I'm photographing, I'm not consciously trying, I'm, as little as I can am I thinking about that technical stuff. Hopefully I've learned it well enough that it happens kind of on semi-autopilot. I know how to fiddle with, it, with all the buttons and do the programming, but I'm really trying to photograph from here. And it's, it's trying to you know, know how to frame the photograph, when to shoot it, that resonates right in, in a heart, kind of a more spiritual heart space. It's interesting you, you said that because um, a lot of people that I've talked to over the years, and myself included, use photography, still photography, as a way of coming out of shells or coming out of trauma or, you know, in, in getting closer to humanity, but yet it's still needing a buffer. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, then the process of that interpretive, how do you look at a tree? How do you look at uh, a street scene? How do, what is it you're seeing that it, other people don't see? I mean, we are living in a time where most people are blind to what's immediately around them. And I, and I think photography is, is a wonderful opportunity to just capture that, that moment, and, and if it's such a thing as capturing a moment. So I was just wondering if you found that uh, at times when you were doing the, the work in ph photographing, that you felt that kind of like a reverse I need to get away from the camera and back into. Yeah, I, I mean, the, during the nine or ten months that we we lived in India and our long trip, most days I didn't pick up my camera because I found that using the camera was going to cut me off from the immediacy of being immersed in a rich experience, and I didn't want to be cut off. So, you know, on a typical day, I did not have my camera out, and then every now and then I would sort of say, "Okay, I'm going to give it a few hours," and I'd get the camera out, and then I run around yeah. sometimes with you know go back to a place I'd seen and sort of say well now I'll try and take a you know see what I can do with a photograph there but um, I didn't want to just walk I didn't just walk around with a camera because first of all it makes you conspicuous as a tourist I, it happens that I look Indian to to pe I can pass for a North Indian if I keep my mouth shut and wear Indian clothes and don't carry a camera uh, I could I could go into sacred temples where where Westerners might not ordinarily be welcome it is interesting that um, there is a desire when traveling like that to kind of become less a camouflaged, if you will, but in a, a way of just becoming part of the, the culture that's there as opposed to looking like yet another outsider that's gawking. The, the other thing that's, that sort of happened that was unexpected is um, uh, for instance, the, the, the guru, the spiritual teacher who established our ashram, sometimes would ask me to take photographs of various things. And uh, one time there was a, a, a very special sacred three-hour ritual going on where they were uh, bathing a representation of Lord Shiva in sacred Ganges water and 12 Brahmin priests were uh, chanting for hours in Sanskrit. And uh, 
you know, the, the guru had told me to go in and take a few pictures, and then he sent in word with, from somebody, okay, now put the camera aside and, and, you know, get into the experience. So I put the camera aside, except at the most sacred moment of the bathing, the representation of, of, of Lord Shiva with, with Ganges water and milk, the head priest points to me and says, you know, which signals, take the picture. And I'm thinking, at the most sacred, in the West, wow. at the most sacred mm -hmm. moment, that's when you'd be asked to put the camera aside. And at the most sacred moment, he was saying, take the picture. And it was one of a number of events that got me thinking about how is the sacred and spirituality experienced here differently mm -hmm. than in the West. Other, other like, experiences that prompted that question was going into temples, and when you get into the inner sanctum of, of a Hindu temple, the priest is, is begging you for money. Mm. Um, or one time we were at an Indian friend's house, there was a ritual they do at around six months of age for when a baby takes their first solid food. There was a long ritual going on to celebrate that. There was a Brahmin priest chanting uh, in Sanskrit. There were about a hundred guests assembled for that, a mixture of Indians and Westerners. And in, in the middle of this thing, we hear a, a cell phone go off and everybody checks their pocket, kind of in embarrassment, hoping it's not their phone. It turns out to be this, the, the Brahmin priest who's doing the <laughs> chanting in Sanskrit, and he takes the call. <laughs> and, uh, you know, what we, I mean, I don't know exactly what to make of that, except what I gradually, you know, came to guess was going on as sort of an amateur uh, anthropologist is that the sharp distinction that we make between what's the sacred and the mundane it just is not operating there. It's always interpenetrated, and that means that the, the, the so-called sacred spaces are, inter, are freely interpenetrated there with mundane, and it's not considered a sacrilege to let the mundane in, intrude in the same way, partly because everything is sacred. I mean, yeah. it's just not that you know, special thing that we have to protect it as a sacred zone, because everything has the sacred seeping man in a palpable way into well, it. Well, let me just ask, I, I agree totally, and with the technology, I think it's quicker around the world, things are changing dramatically that you just don't ex expect to see the cell phones come out in certain <laughs> sacred. In, in some of the photos that you have up now, and they are really getting great reviews, both by staff and people coming through, th that it's transformed our location. It's really brought a lot of energy and light into the building, and we all want to thank you for that. And, and I, I met with two gurus, for example. If, could you just talk about a few that are up on the wall so that people can get a sense of what, what, what was behind that, that photo? Yeah, yeah I was... Um that's a photograph that shows a little boy uh, talking to two seated gurus and, and a couple of standing attendants as the, uh, they're silhouetted with the sun rising over the Ganges behind them. And uh, I was up that morning uh, on the roof of the ashram at sunrise just shooting, taking some photographs of the sun rising over the Ganges. And I heard uh, some chanting, some, some little boys chanting going on, and something told me I better get down there. Yeah. And, it, and it just happened to be that the boys the, in the orphanage were, were chanting morning prayers in front of the gurus, and uh, the light was fantastic. Yeah, it was beautiful. It's beautiful. As is, now your very large piece, the one that's in the very front, I believe it's the unpaved. Yeah, the unpaved crossroads in, in the t little sub, in the little township of Nagua, which is within within the city of Benares. Now, there's a story there too about the. There's a small picture that's next to that about the photo itself was taken of the montage and sent back. Yeah, well, there were a couple of things going on. I did that. That was one of those cases where I knew that corner very well because we had a we went to uh, take Hindi lessons from a teacher who lived in that neighborhood. And there was a little, in the photograph in the background, there's a little tea shop where I would often get there early and have my morning tea while the Indian folks were sort of sitting in the street with the cows walking by, sipping, sipping chai, chai and, <laughs> and reading newspapers. And uh, people in that neighborhood kind of knew me. Mm -hmm. And uh, so it was after having been there for months and never had a camera there, I decided I kind of wanted to capture the richness of that particular neighborhood that I'd come to know well and where I could handle a camera there and not be seen as too intrusive and people kind of knew me. And uh, so I took this sort of 300, I took about a couple of hundred photographs in 45 minutes and then later assembled them with Photoshop into a 360 degree montage. And then uh, I had it printed out at a drugstore 
photography place in India about five feet wide, and we mounted it. And with a, co a couple of friends, one of whom spoke Hindi fluently, we brought it back to the we brought the big photograph back to the neighborhood where I'd ch taken the photographs. And so I have little photographs here of, of people in the neighborhood all gathered around the, the big photo and pointing at who's in it. And, and then I also brought along snapshots that had all the little snapshots that I used to make the montage. I brought along the individual snapshots and gave them out to. That always goes far, doesn't it, with the locals to see the, you know, to get a gift like that is wonderful for many people. Um, I just want to move into current because we're almost up with our time and it's been wonderful visiting with you. But the, um, I understand you just finished a new report, an assessment on the technology assessment for the United States and in other countries to be considered on, I believe it's, it's dealing more about having the citizenry inform uh, government and, and, and the uh, business as to where technology use and how the impact could be or should be considered. Do you want to speak a little bit about that? Because you were at the Woodrow Wilson Institute in D.C. recently, I know, and gave a presentation. Yeah, um, you know, the, uh, you know, the background of this is that, you know, you know, technologies are continually transforming our lives in this society, and it's not always for the best. I mean, we know we, we've overdone it on, on cars and don't have good public transit systems here, and so we've overdone it on high-tech, attempted high-tech cures of disease rather than cheaper and more effective preventive stuff. And so in the early 70s, the Congress established an agency called the Office of Technology Assessment that was charged with trying to study how uh, existing and new technologies affect the society and offer recommendations on how we could make smarter decisions about which technologies to adopt and how to use them and which ones to say, I mean, we shouldn't be doing that. Mm -hmm. And that worked until 95 when uh, Newt Gingrich shut down the Office of Technology Assessment. Ah, yes. And so uh, I've been involved recently with an attempt to reintroduce, te reinstitutionalize technology assessment in this country, except in the 15 years since the office, the Congress's Office of Tech Assessment was shut down, uh, European nations inspired by the U.S. have gone on to establish their own technology assessment agencies, and they've moved beyond us mm. in figuring out that you don't want to just have experts studying technologies. It's also good to find ways to ask ordinary folks opinions, let them get, find ways to let people get informed and then deliberate among themselves. and sort of offer that perspective to government decision makers as well. So I was down in Washington presenting a report I'd written about how we could institutionalize that type of participatory technology assessment in this country. And I understand it got received quite well. So yeah, yeah, there, were, there, there I, was. I look, forward thank to, you. <laughs> I look forward to hearing more about it. I know you're going to be interviewed on Encounters with Jan, hopefully in the near future, which you'll get into that. But I do have to wrap this up, and it's been a pleasure, Richard. It went too fast because I know there's a thousand and one more stories that you have to share with us. And thank you again for your, your photography. It's beautiful, and uh, your work is fantastic uh, with and without the camera. And I encourage the rest of the people watching this to really participate in the Art Walk. Uh, there are the other sites. There is the Amherst Chamber of Commerce, you, of course, ACTV, Amherst Town Hall. You have the Burnett Gallery at Jones Library. You have Gallery A3, and you have the Jones Library, Mango Mango, and University Gallery. So go out and support the local artists. There's plenty around, and we hope to see you here in the audience next month. So come and join us. Thank you very much. <laughs>